Hello and welcome to Mythical Entertainment Interviews. I'm your host, Mythrandial. Today we'll be chatting with Greg Cassavin, Creative Director at Supergiant Games. We'll be discussing their latest project, Pyre, and what makes it different from their previous projects. Stay tuned. Uh, first, Greg, I just wanted to thank you for taking the time to chat with us today. I really appreciate it. Yeah, my pleasure. You've had quite the career up until this point. For people who are unfamiliar with your work, what did you do before working at Supergiant, and what eventually brought you to where you are now? Yeah, um, well, to <laughs> to try to keep that, that yeah, story relatively I'm short. Uh, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, I um, uh, Prior to Supergiant, uh, uh, well, Supergiant is uh, was founded by a guy named Amir Rao and Gavin Simon, who are former colleagues of mine from Electronic Arts in Los Angeles, which is the first uh, game company I worked at um, back in 2007. So we worked together on Command and Conquer 3 and, and Red Alert 3, among other things, so real-time strategy games, so pretty different from the kind of stuff we do now. Um, and we were uh, it, it basically a few years into that, we uh, started to get really inspired by uh, some of the stuff we were seeing um, out there, like smaller games, um, ranging from uh, things like Braid and Castle Crashers and Plants vs. Zombies. We were seeing what small teams are capable of and um, wanted to see if we could do it ourselves. And basically, um, Amir and Gavin uh, dropped everything and moved into a house and started working on the game that became Bastion. Um, and as for me, I uh, at that time, I went to go work at 2K Games uh, and was there for about a year, and then uh, later reunited uh, with with Amir and Gavin. Um, yeah, where we made Bastion and then Transistor, and now we're working on a game called Pyre. Uh, prior to all of that, I worked in the gaming press for a long time, for more than 10 years, uh, kind of fresh out of high school. So games have always been a big part of my life. I always wanted to do something with them. Um, wanted to make them, but uh, uh, one thing led to another, and I ended up writing about them for a really long time before finally getting my shot. Supergiant's most recent title, Transistor, turned a lot of heads and has seen some tremendous success across various platforms. Uh, I know I was I was really excited to see it supported on the new Apple TV when it launched. Now that some time has passed, what lessons did you take away from Transistor, and did you apply these lessons in developing Pyre? Yeah, that's uh, that's a really interesting question. I think I think in some ways, you know, I think in some ways we make things. Uh, harder on ourselves with how we approach new projects because we've kind of made we've tried to make something pretty much from scratch um every single time so uh the the result of that is a lot of like a lot of the knowledge you gain while making a game it feels like very proprietary to exactly what you're making like you learn you learn to solve the very specific problems of the game uh, that you're working on. So if you were to ma make like a direct sequel or something, then then it would probably be really applicable. Um, but if you go on, in our case, we're kind of going into a, a different genre for us. So a lot of the a lot of the specific lessons of like the 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 kind of minute to minute development of Transistor don't necessarily apply. But there are a lot of like high level things that we've gained experience around as a team, I think. Uh, Transistor being our second project, I think we had to sort of, um, we we had to, I, I think we gained a, a certain amount of maturity and experience just going through the process start to finish a second time. And and this time around, I think, I think we felt a little more sure-footed like going into this game. I think we felt a little more comfortable um, making the kind of, uh, uh, big changes relative to our previous game that are on display here. Uh, I, I should, you know, I, I, I think we we always try to push ourselves uh, creatively kind of as much as possible. So we're never that. Um, I think we try to push ourselves out of our comfort zone enough to that we're never like sitting cozy with with what we're doing. But but um, I think I think we've tried to sort of embrace uh, aspects of our process that have that have been uh, that have been scarier in the past, uh, namely, uh, part of how we do things is being a relatively small team um, of like about a dozen people. We just we just try as much as possible to get everyone on the team working on what they 
care about early on. So we don't start with a big design document and try to kind of push everyone toward one particular design. We just spend a lot of time exploring and then try to kind of meet in the middle and find the common ground between those ideas. Um, and that can be pretty scary during pre-production when you're not quite sure uh, what you're making or what the game is going to turn out to be. But um, I think sort of history tells us that um, our process turns out well in the end. And, and I think this time we've uh, had a little more faith in it from the start. Tell me a bit about Supergiant's new title, Pyre. What is it about and where did it come from? Yeah, so in uh, this is a game uh, in which you, you lead a band of exiles to freedom through uh, a series of these ancient competitions uh, spread across this mystical purgatory. Uh, we consider it to be a party-based role-playing game. Uh, our previous games are, are action RPGs where you kind of have direct control over a specific character. Um, you move around, you, you kind of, moment to moment, uh, it's, it's like a combat-oriented experience, and we've used voiceover narration kind of to deliver the story. Uh, whereas in Pyre, um, it's, the whole format of the game is quite different. You, you spend uh, a portion of the game traversing this big uh, overmap, spending uh, the equivalent of days uh, in the world of the game, just sort of traveling to these uh, celestial landmarks where this competition called The Rites takes place. And then once you finally arrive there, it's this, it's this kind of uh, team-oriented uh, confrontation, this, this like competitive ritual that unfolds versus a variety of uh, different characters. Uh, where it all came from for us was um, it, a lot of it uh, came from the desire to make a game with a larger cast of characters than what we've been able to do in the past. We've really enjoyed like creating the worlds for our games and the cast of characters in our games, but the, the, the numbers of characters in our games previously has been a very small. They've been these uh, rather kind of solitary feeling experiences by design. Whereas this time around, we, we were really interested in seeing what it might be like to just almost have the feel of like a fantasy road trip type of thing where you're just uh, kind of getting closer to a larger group of characters um, over, over a longer period of time in the world of the game. Um, and then, you know, a, a lot of these gameplay ideas of like a competition in which these characters have to depend on one another to achieve what they want uh, as a group and what they want individually, that all, um, that all started to make a lot of sense to us. One thing that a lot of people noticed in, in previous Supergiant games is the quality of the voice acting. Uh, so with Pyre, at least, at least so far, the characters uh, seem to speak gibberish. Is there a particular reason Pyre doesn't feature voice acting, which is really a, a trademark of your previous titles? Uh, yeah, that, that's a good, that, that's, uh, I think for sure, one of the kind of big format uh, changes, um, having made uh, two games thus far where, where we, we really explored how narrative could be delivered uh, kind of almost exclusively through voiceover. We were just, uh, as ever, mostly interested in, in seeing what else we could do, what else we could explore. And, and part of um, wanting to make a game with a larger cast of characters, there was, there was a, a practicality toward using the written word, um, especially uh, if there was going to be story and, and, and kind of narrative context provided in the way that we're providing it. Like if it were all fully voiced, it would slow the pace of the game uh, pretty, uh, pretty tremendously and, and prevent us from, from using a few of the tricks that we're using. And we also wanted to explore using the written word uh, in particular as, as like, as as being rather central to the wor world of this game, um, even though you know the use of text in games obviously is not uh, in and of itself unusual, uh, we wanted to see what we could do with it if um, if that makes sense. So so for example, um, in in the world of the game, it, we wanted to make the act of reading feel significant even in the world of this game. So so as an example of that, the you discover early on that. Uh, literacy in this world has has been outlawed for for centuries. So the mere fact that you can read uh, in this world is, is actually a source of power and makes you quite relevant to the characters uh, that you meet. So getting getting players to sort of consciously be aware um, of their of their ability to read and trying to make the reading experience as as interactive as possible and feel seamlessly integrated with the game that that was kind of very much our goal um, r rather than just like oh it's it's like a less good version of uh, having voiceover. And there is there is uh, plenty of uh, voiceover. We, we just kind of try to do new things with a uh, with a narrative one way or another. So we're using voice uh, in new ways, and we're using text in new ways. I think as well. 
It's interesting that you bring that up. I hadn't quite made that connection yet. Uh, you know, if you, if you have a character whose primary strength is in reading it, it makes sense that text would play such a central role. And I was actually noticing in some of the early dialogue, there's some red text that you can interact with. Uh, it really lends a lot of power and weight to words uh, in the game. Yeah, that thanks for for noticing some of those details. Yeah, like it's a it's a relatively small thing from our perspective, but we were really pleased with how many folks picked up on it when we first showed the game at, at PAX a, a couple of weeks ago. That yeah, we have this. It's basically like a tooltip system that um, any any keywords or key terms throughout the game, you can just sort of highlight them and find out what they are. And um, it, 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 and it just saves us a lot of kind of bad writing, like bad expository writing. Yeah, exactly. um, like, oh, you know, there, there's the tower. Let me tell you all about that. Yeah, or like, you know, my 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 dear sister. Ever since we were children, you know, you you always trained with the blade or whatever. So so yeah, um, that that kind of stuff. It, it, like it's in our case, any information that that your character would have access to as like someone who who belongs to this world. Um, is is just kind of available to you uh, at at the you know at sort of the at the uh, highlight of a term. Um, so uh, and and we have we have some tricks around that as well. That uh, again, just to keep it feeling interactive and interesting. So even though you're you're reading, which I think people I think people intuitively consider reading to be kind of a passive experience, but it's really it, it's really not uh, when when the reading is is kind of engaging and has a level of interactivity to it. Pyre definitely features some strategic gameplay, as did Transistor with the turn system. What are some of your inspirations for gameplay and combat? Yeah, so um, we, I as as I as I mentioned before, I think I think this sort of this focus on a larger group of characters and this this setting. Where they they have to kind of work together to to uh, to be liberated. That um, informed a lot of the aspects of of the play experience, where it's it's three characters at a time having to coordinate and and really depend on each other. One character alone would not be able to succeed or even participate in one of these uh, in one of these rituals uh, that that are central to the game. I think we also liked this idea of like a mystical competition for for kind of the mere reason that we could we could invent the rules right like we could just come up with whatever best served the gameplay um and present it in such a way that it adds to sort of the sense of mystique and adds to the the sense that this is really kind of this ancient uh this ancient form of of competition in this world uh and and over time it sort of took on uh, as as some folks have uh, have observed, it it actually took on some characteristics of uh, of certain sports. And and at PAX we had people you know compare it to like rugby and ice hockey and Quidditch and like all kinds of different things like that. And it was interesting to see that for different people it 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 um, evoked uh, these different things because it is it is this kind of pitched competition where um, I, I I should mention another key aspect that uh, it's Although, uh, although kind of intended to, to be intense in its own right, it's 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 a non-lethal competition. It's like a mystical competition. And what was important to us about that was that we wanted the stakes in this game to actually be, if anything, like sort of greater than the typical life and death struggle in a video game. Because in a, a typical video game, when you fail a given battle, well, you die, but you hit a button and and you try again until you don't die. Uh, but in the context of the game. You're like you as a player. You're learning a lot. You're learning the patterns of the enemies you're fighting, and so on. But your character, like narratively, nothing is happening. The game is at a standstill until until you advance through the sequence. Whereas we wanted a game where the game advanced uh, even uh, from failure, and that required for the characters to live through their encounters, to be able to learn from their defeats as well as their victories. Because this this game is about these characters' kind of path toward enlightenment um, and. Uh, much like in real life, we often learn from uh, from our our failures, not not just from from our successes. I think that you've seen some success in creating a unique experience with the rights because people say, "Oh, it's similar to this, but it's not quite that game." You know, so I think you've you've succeeded in creating a unique experience. So that that's impressive. 
Yeah, we and we we like appreciate that. We um, I think we're always on some level. We've always been. We've experienced that with every game that we've worked on, where like when we first show it, um, folks start comparing it uh, to to other things, and and on some level we get uh, we get nervous about that. We're like, uh, and we we talk a lot about it internally, but we we always make peace with it in the end. I think I think that's just how people. Um, they have to, they that, have to relate yeah, to it. Like the, the, yeah, they that's how. It, it, that's right, and and we nor nor do we want to make things that are kind of. Um, we're we're never kind of endeavoring to make something that is like strange for the sake of being strange. Uh, we we just try to make things that that feel kind of proprietary to the worlds of our games. So so I I think you know, I think the kind of uh, the the ideal is often this this kind of like unusual yet yet familiar in some ways type of combination. Um, and I think we have been able to achieve that with our previous games one way or another. And hopefully we're we're on the path with this one too. The art style for Bastion, Transistor, and Pyre are all very similar. Is this Supergiant's signature art style? Is it a key visual for players to know that they've picked up a Supergiant game? Uh, you know, are you basically working on on building your own aesthetic? Yeah, that, that's uh, so. So um, it's easy uh, to answer where it comes from, and that the answer to that is. Um, it's a woman named Jen Z, who is our art director. She, I, I think, she does really extraordinary work. Uh, she, we, we have a team of artists now. Um, a guy named uh, Camilo Vanegas does all of our uh, animations and 3D modeling, and and Josh Barnett uh, does uh, a lot of the does all the visual effects in the game that that I think have really pushed our games to to look even better than than they have in the past. But the the kind of the art vision. Uh, definitely comes from Jen, uh, and she does all of the kind of uh, painterly, uh, painterly artwork, character artwork, and environment art, uh, that sort of thing. She does all that herself. And on and on Bastion, she was the only artist on the, on the entire project. Um, so it, it, I think I think it, a lot of the a lot of the if there's similarity between the looks of our games, I think it's just a function of us being a small team. Um, at the same time, I think from our perspective, we you know, in trying to create um, original games each time, we we do our best to kind of create a specific look and feel for each of them that feels distinct to those games. But but certainly, I, I see uh, your point that there's some common ground. Like these are all these are all two D games with like a painterly style, and that's that's like a largely a a function of of uh, Jen's specialty and and what what our technology uh that that we have have made for our games is kind of best capable of rendering and stuff like that so hopefully we kind of fall into the right place with that where each of our games feels very distinct and yet uh players who have stuck with us for more than one game are able to see some kind of uh see like a through line through them in in like a positive way um there are certainly game you know some of my favorite game studios uh as a you know growing up I'd, I'd play their games you know sight unseen and even though they were different games it, it, they just had a certain feel um and i i always really appreciated that that quality so i i think it would be really great if if we could uh, achieve that at some point too will you be at any conventions in the coming months to promote pyre or represent supergiant i know you were recently at pax east is that correct yeah, we um, so we've been going to PAX uh, Prime and PAX East for for many years now. Ever since we first uh, unveiled Bastion in 2010, we've gone to every Prime and East since then. So this was our sixth uh, consecutive PAX East, which I had to like count on on my fingers to to make sure that was actually true. Um, yeah, um, and and so so those are kind of the main those are the main events we go to every year and then typically uh once in a while we've gone to e3 um which is coming up pretty soon i don't i don't, I don't know that we're going to be there in in any official c capacity but i just enjoy that show so i might i might stop by um and then um we've gone to the playstation experience one time in its kind of inaugural year sony's done that for a couple of years now um so it's possible we will go to that again this year if it uh, if it happens. But that's kind of uh, we found that the two packs is a year is a is a good a good cadence for us. We can kind of plan around it. We show up 
no matter what. And it's just always just really, really great and kind of uh, soothes the soul for us to just be able to interact with people who've played our games and just show whatever we have to show at that time. Yeah, and just, just talking to people who've been, who've, who've played your games and been, you know, affected by them or, or just like, you know, to, to whatever extent they've been affected by them. It's always like really interesting to hear and because day in and day out, I mean, we're, we're just kind of hunkered down in front of our computers, right? Like we may get emails and nice comments on the internet or something from, um, from time to time. And, and that's, that's really wonderful and helps keeps us, uh, keeps us going. Uh, th though nothing compares to like getting that kind of, uh, feedback. Yeah. F kind of face to face from someone. Yeah, I mean, you get those positive notes of encouragement, uh, but there's nothing like seeing someone play your game for the first time and, and watching people sort of gather around and experience it that you finally go, you know, yeah, this this was all worth it. Yeah, no, that, that's absolutely right. It, it was actually, it, it's, um, the, and that's why we go to that show really uh, and why why we kind of reveal our games in this fashion where we want to make sure that they're playable um, and and ready to sort of hand off to someone with no caveats uh, at the time that they're announced because uh, we we really we really value those reactions a lot and they really do make everything feel worth it to us you, you know historically because I myself as a game player I'm like I may be playing my favorite game in the world but I'm pretty kind of stone faced you'd never for all you know if you're just looking at me playing it you'd, like, you'd think I yeah, you'd think I you'd think I hated it, and afterwards I'd be like, "That'd be awesome. Uh, that was awesome, or whatever." But but um, uh, yeah, seeing seeing people kind of visibly affected at PAX is is really something else. Well, Greg, thanks again for taking the time to chat with us today. We really appreciate it, and we wish you all the the best of luck and success with your new project, Pyre. Thank you. Thank you very much.